Hello and welcome everyone to the Freedom Lecture here in the Bali. Um, a very warm welcome to all of you here in the room with me and also a very warm welcome to the people who are watching through the live stream from home. Um, my name is Sophie Rutefrans, I'm a program editor here and I will also be your moderator tonight. Um, we are very happy and also very honored that we have a, a special guest tonight with us, um, activist, former politician and now also living in exile, Nathan Law. Very happy that he's here with us. Um, he also wrote a book about freedom uh, which is also available after the program uh, for everyone who is interested and today he will share with us his story about freedom in Hong Kong. Um, he would not have been here without the support of Stichting Democratie and Media and het Veefonds uh, who support these series of lectures about freedom. Um, so we will talk with Nathan Law about his uh, fight for freedom and we will also talk with two other guests um, and we will take it more to a geopolitical perspective um, and see how the world is responding to the situation in Hong Kong and the situation in China. And we will do that with Thies Dams, a research fellow at Klingendaal and also author of the first biography in Dutch um, of Xi Jinping uh, called The New Emperor. And we will also talk with Thijs Reut, a member of the Europe European Parliament for the Dutch PvdA and uh, in Europe, the SND group. Uh, we will talk with them uh, about the geopolitics, but we will first listen to the Freedom Lecture of Nathan Law. Thank you so much, Sophie, and um, good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and anyone in between and with, uh, outside Boundary. Um, thank you so much for coming. Uh, when I received an email about inviting me to have a freedom lecture, I was nervous because as a student, I often skip lectures, so I was worried whether there will be many people turning out. Um, in effect, you are a better audience than I, um, but I guess some of you may be a little bit nervous because when you attend a lecture, you are supposed to have some readings. And if you haven't read Freedom, that's fine because you don't have to read it actually. But uh, if you haven't bought it or haven't read it, you can definitely buy it. Uh, the Dutch version is out. Uh, my publisher is selling really hardly outside of it. So if you can help him to uh, listen his burden, I would be much um, appreciated. Um, but anyway, um, in today's Freedom Lecture, I think um, it is my mission and my purpose to remind every one of you that we are in an era of democratic backsliding. We've seen war launched because of authoritarian expansion and see people imprisoned, died because of it. For many of us, the story of democratic resection is a grand narrative, is a big concept, but for me it's deeply personal and it's deeply painful. I'm from Hong Kong, uh, the place I call home, the city that I love and would love to be buried in. When I talk about Hong Kong, a lot of scenes flash back in my memory and they have all become part of the city's history. On 17th, August 2017, I was sitting in a dock of the Court of Appeal in Hong Kong with Joshua Wong and Alex Chow. We were both sentenced to months of imprisonment because of inciting and participating in unlawful assembly. I served jailed with them. We both knew that Hong Kong we used to know had gone. And being an activist, uh, we knew that there would be a lot of difficulties laying ahead of us. On 26th June 2020, I boarded a plane leaving Hong Kong. When I arrived at the airport, I was so nervous. I handed over my passport for checking and they let me through. I felt really fortunate that they could have detained me because I were in some sort of blacklist. I boarded the plane and sat with my seatbelt buckled as the pre-flight checks were completed. Then we took off and I knew that I was safe. I was sitting in the window seat and I looked down at Hong Kong. By night, it was the most gorgeous nightscape I've ever seen. At that moment, I understand that it was probably the last time I would be able to see the city in that form with my bare eye, the city that I've been fighting for, that I served, that I was jailed for. Probably it would be the last time to see the skyline and the last time that I could lay an eye on people that I loved. Now as a political refugee in the United Kingdom, I continue to advocate for freedom and human rights for Hong Kong people and around the world. It's already not 
been almost two years since I left Hong Kong. Yet the situation there only has grown worse and worse. Weeks ago, the former head of security bureau, Zhang Li, was appointed by Beijing as the chief executive, the top official of the city. There was only one candidate, and he was selected, quote unquote, by an election committee with 1,500 members who are Beijing's allies. He received more than 99% of the vote under Chinese Communist Party's blessing. Our city's leader was appointed without Hong Kong people's voice. He is exactly the person who forced countless of Hong Kong people fleeing the city to be prosecuted and put in jail. To a certain extent, he is the head of a suppressive system that forced me to leave my hometown. My closest ally and friend, Joshua Wong, the most prominent and high-profile young activist in Hong Kong, meanwhile has been in jail for more than 16 months. We still don't know when he could get out because a trial has not yet been set. Under the current system, we have no votes to elect the city's leader and the legislature is dominated by Beijing. Years ago, when we talk about Hong Kong, people always associated with the Pearl of the Orient or one of the freest city in Asia. But for now, all we can connect the city to is authoritarianism and loss of freedom. After the 2019 protest, tens of thousands of protesters were arrested and more than 2,000 of them have been charged. The implementation of the national security law in June 2020 marked the end of free speech and political campaigners have been jailed before trials and appeared in court with government appointed judges. For the past few years, We've seen the steepest decline in freedom in this city under the Chinese totalitarian control. It has turned Hong Kong to an authoritarian police state, which our basic freedom, human rights and freedoms are severely curtailed. In the Freedom in the World 2020 report produced by Freedom House, it describes Hong Kong's situation as follows. The territory's most prominent pro-democracy figures have been arrested under its provisions and the national security law charges or the threat of the charges have resulted in the closure of political parties, major independent news outlets, peaceful non-governmental organizations and unions. The national security law also paved the way for Beijing to overhaul Hong Kong's electoral system in 2021. The new rules permit mainland authorities to vet candidates and contain other provisions that ultimately ensure Beijing near total control over the selection of Hong Kong authorities." End quote. For the past few decades, Hong Kong people per persist despite Beijing's growing influence and suppression. We have demonstrated enormous amount of courage and love to the city that we belong. We do it also because of an unfulfilled promise from Beijing. In the 80s, when Hong Kong was still a British colony, the Chinese government and the British government were in a negotiation about Hong Kong's future. The British government wanted Hong Kong to remain free and live in a separate system from China. Hong Kong people shared this demand. We were worried that the one-party dictatorship in mainland China, that it would destroy our way of life and freedom. The transfer of sovereignty completed in 1997, which Beijing promised that Hong Kong would enjoy high degree of autonomy under the framework of one country, two systems that guarantees Hong Kong people ruling Hong Kong. In other words, freedom, autonomy, rule of law and democracy are the cornerstones of Hong Kong's system, which Beijing had promised us in the 80s. These commitments were also the reason why we have a smooth transfer in 1997, conducted under the shadow of Tiananmen Massacre, which thousands of protesters demanding accountability and democracy murdered by the Chinese Communist Party on the streets of Beijing in 1989. History proved that our concern was right. These promises have never been delivered. In 2014, Hong Kong people were fed up with Beijing's broken promises. 
During the consultation of election reform, Hong Kong people occupied the major runways of Hong Kong to express their eagerness of a fully democratically elected legislature and government. That was the moment I stepped into spotlight. I was a student leader in this umbrella movement involved in the only debate and negotiation with the government representatives. My life had completely changed afterwards. That the identity of an activist has branded into my heart. There's always a major part of my energy and my faith committed to an ideal which precipitates the advancement and betterment of the society. Yet I was never the type of activist people may associate. That I was born in that way, that I chase my dreams without hesitations, that I'm invincible, that I don't have ups and downs. I never grew up thinking that I'm in my position now. Being an activist in exile, served the government, having been to jail, um, wanted in my home city and becoming one of the person that represent Hong Kong on the international level. I grew up in one of the roughest neighborhood in Hong Kong, learning that I should focus on securing a stable life. I had a very traditional, traditional only blue color family. My father was a construction worker. My mother was a street cleaner. Basically my whole childhood was running around with my mother um, door to door, step by step to collect garbages and clean up for her. They were both from mainland China my father took a dangerous raft boat trip in the late 70s and to come to Hong Kong illegally. They left China because of economic and political turmoil, which perpetuated the whole China in 60s and 70s. They both had a so-called refugee mentality, as I describe. They want their sons to find a good job, get a stable life, and don't rock the boat. They did not talk about freedom, human rights, civil liberties, or any relevant concepts in my home education. All they want was a happy and fruitful life for me that allows me to climb up the social ladder. I was not born and raised to be an activist, to be a dissident, and I neither chose to become. In the context of living under an authoritarian regime or even a totalitarian fascist one, you don't choose to become a dissident, you become one. In the world of in the word of Václav Havel, a former playwright and dissident, and the first president of the Czech Republic, he wrote, we never decided to become dissidents. We have been transformed into them without quite knowing how. Sometimes we have ended up in prison without precisely knowing how. We simply went ahead and did certain things that we felt we ought to do so, and that seemed to us decent to do, nothing more nor less. End quote. It was never my intention to become an activist, to de dedicate my life to fight for freedom, democracy, and justice. It was this autocratic regime that forced me and many others to first stand up and speak out in defense of our liberties and our way of life. No one chooses to become a dissident. To become to dissent is a reaction. For me, it, it takes time to consolidate my belief and to transform them into actions. I learned about the concepts of human rights and liberties and freedom by reading stories of Liu Xiaobo in high school. He was a Chinese dissident and a writer who received Nobel Peace Prize in 2010. He eventually died in China's custody in 2017, which coincidentally, it was on my birthday. After high school, I became a student activist in university and represented my university's student union. By then, I was still very hesitant to fully commit myself into activism. As a university, university's freshman, I was afraid of being arrested, as we all understand, as the criminal record would tarnish my, work, uh, my opportunity for work. I was not prepared to become a public figure as well. But during the first year of being involved in social activism, I witnessed activists being arrested, underprivileged people being mistreated, government turning a blind eye on our demands, and people frustrated of being ignored. It was the government's repression that forced me to be determined to resist, that I would risk my material betterment or even my future of staying where I love. 
being a dissident in this situation is not without cost. It is not fashionable or looking cool. Sometimes it is painful, but it is definitely meaningful. In this path, I've gained much more than I lost. I became the youngest parliamentarian in Hong Kong at the age of 23 in 2016. I've received so much support and love from the people. And now even in the life of exile and as a refugee, I still have the international recognition that I can speak up for them and the ideas that I represent. Many others like me who are ordinary, had the slightest connection to politics and social movement, had become dissidents because we just want to be honest to ourselves. In the peak of the 2019 protest movement, there were more than 2 million Hong Kong people marched down to the street. It's more than a quarter of our population. Just try to imagine what would happen if it happens in Netherlands or in Amsterdam. The whole system will be changed. The government will be held accountable. But the Hong Kong government didn't respond to our demands. Instead, they intensified the suppression and destroyed our systems. With the worsening political climate, the social fabrics also changed. For people like me, it becomes much more difficult to connect to the others. I had to cut my ties with my family when I left Hong Kong. I knew that the government would go after relatives of dissidents as they had shown certain track record in mainland China in order to threaten us. I don't want it to happen to my family, so that's the decisions I made. I can no longer interact with some of my close friends anymore due to political risk. Meanwhile, some of them have intentionally distanced themselves from me because of the same reason. The path towards justice most of the time is long and lonely. It's your determination that navigates you, your path. It's not easy to be an activist. For me, a good activist is characterized by commitment, self-discipline, and sense of calm. Without commitment, nothing can be achieved. Social movements are always a, a struggle. As you are up against the powerful, whether it is government or large corporations. By, def by definition, political might and the power of capital generate huge advantages. Activists only have the power of people. There will inevitably be defeat, as I've been through so many of them, and times when the situation may seem hopeless. But we must persevere. Only with commitment and determination is change possible. It is also best to be cautious and to be in control. Don't get carried away by your emotions. Accept that you will always let some people down and that some will represent you, will misrepresent you, and that others will always fight out. Even people within the movement may criticize or attack you. In any movement, there will be politics. People will criticize you for whatever reasons that they can think of. Your background, your appearances, your attitude. Try to digest them and see them as momentum to move forward. Learn to identify and welcome constructive criticism, including from your most ferocious critics. Never pass up an opportunity to learn. Life is a continuing learning experience, and you shouldn't be afraid to admit mistakes or to change your view. Everything evolves, people, circumstances, and movements. What is most important is to be honest to yourself and your core values. In adversity and defeat, find opportunities to learn and to grow stronger as a person. Learn lessons to be better prepared for the next time. See each setback as a test to your commitment, each challenge as a test of character. Remain calm if you can, and if you feel you're losing control, try to seek out the time and space that will allow you to, for perspective. The truth is that activist is not hero. We are not invincible. We are just people who have a million other things that compete our attention. Neither is activism a hobby. Real activism is not fun. Believing in an idea that challenged the status quo is not fun. 
it is something you find yourself drawn to because you feel deep down that is important. Activism, activism begins with values and should be driven by them. You don't have to be especially clever, brave, principled, or good to be an activist. You have to care enough about an issue to want to see change for the better. Looking back, I've no regrets over the journeys I've been through. I'm honored to represent Hong Kong people and fight alongside with them. At the end of the day, what Hong Kong has been through is a reflection of the global democratic recession. In a mouth, the most ferocious dictators, the Chinese Communist Party has been, been in the center of undermining our freedom and democracy. Beijing is getting more and more confident over its more technologically advanced and sophisticated Orwellian model. They disregard any commitment to human rights and international obligations. In December last year, countering the Summer for Democracy host by the Biden administration, in which I was privileged to speak as the sole Hong Kong representative, the, the CCP published a white paper over its allegedly China's democracy. They claim that China's democracy is the one that works. They tried to redefine democracy, that universal suffrage, checks and balances, and division of power are not part of it. They call the totalitarian system in China, in which the people have absolutely no right to elect their country's leaders as a democracy. This is the degree of information, warfare, and hostility of the Chinese Communist Party imposing to the world. They are trying to rewrite the history of Hong Kong, the culture of Hong Kong, what it means to be a Hong Konger, and most importantly, the democratic values that we all treasure. In this global struggle against the rise of authoritarianism, we must address them with all that we have. As a dissident, fighting for democracy not only for Hong Kong people, but for all, we must continue to find ways to hold the Chinese Communist Party accountable. We must forge better multilateral partnerships in order to coordinate global pushback. And we have to support persecuted political activists from Hong Kong and from all around the world to continue their fight. We must grab every opportunity to send a signal and stop the, the complacency and appeasement strategies that we had. At the end of the day, being an activist is not only about fulfilling our own mission, but also achieving concrete changes. The Chinese Communist Party is the origin of suppression of Hong Kong people, and it's my duty to continue to challenge their approach and hope that one day Hong Kong people can have their own city back. I firmly, I firmly believe that what I'm doing is paving my way home. Even though I'm away from the city that I love, my heart is still attached to them. It is not an easy path, but I'm determined to walk. My most sincere wish is that when I grow old and look into the mirror, when my hair grow white and gray or, or gone, when I look into the one in the mirror, I don't hate that guy. And I do believe that, and I do hope that all of you may want the same thing. Thank you so much. Thank you so much uh, for your beautiful speech um, and also for calling us uh, out on helping you uh, raise those democratic values. I want to go back a little bit to um, the first time that you became an activist because you told us you were not politically raised, you were not uh, particularly interested in politics, you were actually forced by the circumstances to become one. Um, what was the first steps you took there? The first step I took was um, to be involved in the student union um, because I think as a university student, we had the leisure where at the time we, we didn't have much burden as we grow old, like to be a parent or be a husband or be a wife. Um, and I don't have much financial um, needs that I need to carry. So I think that was actually the time when we had the most excitement about knowledge, about social change and that idealism that perpetuates 
the whole um, intellectual journey. So I, 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 I do believe that university is best time for activism. Yeah. And I encourage a lot of university students to do it as well, because I think it is definitely a life-changing moment. And it is by committing to something that you believe, not something you work for salary or something that you play for fun, that you genuinely understand yourself and realize what are your goals in, in your life. Maybe after you try it, you found it so stress, like stressful and you just don't like it. But at the end of the day, you, you know a bit more about yourself. Yeah. So I think that's, that's I think the best time to, to be involved. To, to be involved, yeah. Be, uh, because you were arrested several times, um, actually, uh, during the protests um, over several years. Well, were you ever in doubt? Should I stop? Should I just not do this anymore? I think my, sometimes my, my personal um, agency in, 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 in this circumstance is, is quite complicated. On the one hand, you have, your, you have your agency that you wanted to do things. But on the other hand, when you look at the background of what Hong Kong have been through, what your fellows have been through, and they were in jail, they were also being persecuted, they were, they were being beaten, and they suffer much more um, than, you, than probably you are suffering. And um, many times when I read about great leaders in history with read their autobiography, um, many of them, they've been in jail for decades or being arrested for, for many dozen times so that um, this, the seeds of their activism will grow. Um, by then, I, I feel very humble for what I've been through and I don't feel like that was something that would really um, um, hinder me from, from moving on. And for me, um, that sounds very lateral to, to continue to go on that path. So um, I, I didn't really have much like thoughts about leaving yeah. the, the, the way it was supposed to be. And, um, but I, I think it, it was also because of sense of responsibility. Um, um, in 2014 and afterwards, I, I become a public figure that people had their trust and their support on me. And most of the time, I, I do feel like my personal agency in that setting um, would be diminished because of how the society evolves around, around the, 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 the circumstance. Yeah, because you were not a protester, a regular protester. You were the leader of the protest at one point, right? Um, y yeah, but um, I, I think there were so many different protests around so m much like injustice in the society. So I often act as a, 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 a protester, but um, people will see you as um, the kind of... Um, person that they would look up to, that yeah. they would seek advice, that they would um, want to want you to encourage them. And rather than a protest leader in many sense, that kind of like leadership is what they're seeking for. Is that also the hardest thing about being an activist, the responsibility that you have for others? I think it re really depends on who you are. I, I, I found having that responsibility um, part of my life, it completes my life. Um, I'm a person, if I don't have any responsibility, I, I will feel like worthless. <laughs> and, um, and that was what motivates me. It's always when you look at the others, when you feel down and you feel like sometimes helpless and you get encouragement from the others and they look up to you and they um, know, know that you, you, you are really tough, You're, you've been through a tough period but they also wanted you to, to continue to be here and to, to work with them, to, to march for one more mile with them. And I think that is a really powerful um, sentiment and, and um, an environment that, um, that help push everyone uh, more than they had prepared probably. Yeah. Um, is there also something in that you are the first of the generation that is really born also in Hong Kong and raised? And does that give this generation a particularly interest in activism and in democracy because they have been there all their lives? Uh, our generation is quite special. Um, I was not born in Hong Kong, but I moved to Hong Kong in Essex. So I, I basically grew up in Hong Kong. And um, for us, Hong Kong is our home. We have a strong sense of attachment and sense of belonging. Um, oftentimes when our parents, they, they were like first immigrants, uh, first generation of immigrants from mainland China, they would still feel like um, the places that they were born in mainland China as 
where they belong as their, their, their hometown. But for us, we, 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 we we're so clear that we, we, we live in Hong Kong, we speak Cantonese, we write traditional Chinese, we believe in the values um, that Hong Kong people believe in. And it's that sense of ingrained into the city and sense of belonging that precipitates a lot of our reaction that we wanted to protect, to protect our city, to protect our people, and also the values behind it. So that kind of strong sense of um, attachment and sense of belonging really motivates uh, and energize the whole um, protest movement. Yeah, because you're not the only ones um, uh, of the generations that are really rising up right now, because there is also the Milk Tea Alliance. Maybe you can tell something about that. So the Milk Tea Alliance is, is an online virtual community that um, for countries that have certain specific kind of milk tea, like the one in Myanmar, the one in Thailand, the one in Taiwan, that we um, have um, the community to support each other, mainly against um, totalitarian, uh, totalitarian crackdowns and China's suppression. Um, I, I think this is a very interesting online phenomenon because without the use of social media, it can never be achieved. No. We've got language barrier, we've got knowledge barrier, but with that kind of identity that glue us together, it, it on the one hand helps amplify each our own voices. When I heard protest in my mind in Thailand that I could definitely tweet and add a hashtag so that I feel like I'm part of it. Um, I, and I can, I can speak up for them. So it really amplify all the uh, movements, each, all the movements. Yeah. And it really um, shows that there is a very vibrant and moving community that um, in these really dark times and, 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 and these very suppressed area, that there are a group of people with really clear message and faces that they can still speak up. Um, so I think it is a, uh, is a very interesting phenomenon. Um, um, it, it really helps to bring all the movement alive. Yeah. So you live uh, in London now, you are uh, exiled, uh, self-exiled. Um, when did you make that decision that it was time to go? In June 2020, before the implementation of the national security law, we all knew that the law would be so draconian that it criminalized free speech and basically all the advocacy work we had been doing would be seen as violating the national security law. Um, so that we had come to um, a time to think about how we can sustain the movement. Um, for me, it was quite natural that uh, we need a voice outside of Hong Kong to continue to speak up for Hong Kong people and continue to speak up the demands that we've been doing. For example, holding Chinese Communist Party accountable, sanctioning officials that are responsible for human rights violations, etc. Um, so that was the time I had made my decision of leaving. And uh, for now, I'm a wanted fugitive. Um, if I were to go back to Hong Kong now, I would probably face decades of imprisonment. Can you explain a little bit more about how the national security law is changing Hong Kong? The national security law um, provides a legal weapon for the government to determine what kinds of actions are violating the national security law, which the definition is really, really fake. No one can even tell where the so-called red lines are. And for the national security court, all the judges are appointed by Beijing. Um, there are no jury trials and the national security law overrides all ordinance that protect human rights. So we can often see um, people, um, they are already in jail for years, more than a year without a bail because it has no presumption of bail, things like this. Um, it really is a, a, a draconian law that changed the whole landscape of Hong Kong. People stopped talking about politics on the street. They even stopped talking about it, most of them, on the internet. And I've got some friends who've just been to London and we, ha we, catch up, we had a catch up. And she told me that she wouldn't even dare to wear a yellow scarf on the street because yellow resembles the color of the protest. And, and it's not explicitly in the law that you can't wear yellow, but she takes the precaution not to wear it because in case that it's seen as a provocation. It has become a white terror, a, a fear in our culture that um, whatever you do something that may associate you to the protest, people would be terrified because they don't know what would constitute a, a, a breach of the national security law because it was defined so vaguely 
and um, it really perpetuates the whole, whole, whole life of yours. It has transformed um, how Hong Kong people live and talk and associate and probably how they think in that way. Yeah. One of the things um, that struck me really in your book is that um, it's not always said that you are safe outside of the borders of China and not in particular you, well, maybe you as well, but that there are also threats coming from Chinese people, maybe the Chinese government while you are in the United States or in Europe even. Um, can you tell a bit about that? The source of threats um, comes with different forms. Um, the most official one would be China putting my name on an international protocol that um, asks um, countries that have extradition treaty with them to extradite me if I were to cross their borders. Um, so probably if I were going to Thailand or Russia, for example, then I will be like kidnapped and to, to be put on a plane and going back to China and face decades of imprisonment. Um, and second way of, of course is um, extra legal ways that um, we all understand how far reaching China's reach could be. And they have so much influence, um, not only to Chinese people, but over overseas Chinese organizations and also um, the agents working for them. Um, so definitely there has always been um, a sense of insecurity. Um, I wouldn't say that I am always in a danger of some kind of like life threatening no. attacks, but um, there's always a sense of insecurity and and for me, like you can't just wipe it out. Um, but um, I wouldn't let me let it to stop what I'm doing because that's exactly what they want. Yeah. Um, so I'll continue to speak up for my people and, and the values that we all treasure. And these threats, are they also uh, coming from online? Is that also a thing? Online harassment and this information campaign has always been um, a part of the conglomeration of propaganda and this information warfare that China has been launching. Um, so they've, they've published so many wrong stuff about me in order to stigmatize me. It is less about like a physical harm, but in the way that to discredit you and stigmatize you as an activist, therefore to discredit the whole movement. Um, I, I think they are propaganda for now is less and less convincing as people have more and more awareness over these lies that they've been telling. And um, the understanding of um, the nature of the Chinese Communist Party and the nature of the Hong Kong movement have also grown for the past years. So I think they are, this information, the information warfare which is getting less and less impactful. Yeah, well, that's a hopeful thing maybe. Um, I would like to ask uh, if Thies Dams, a research fellow at Klingendaal, would like to join us and also Thijs Reut, a member of the European Parliament. Please welcome, have a seat. Um, Thies, to start with you, uh, how do you listen to the story of Nathan so far? Well, extremely interested um, and um, struck by the by the hope, I guess, that you've pointed out in your in your last sentences, um, and that's because my trade is geopolitics, and that's not a trade that trades in hope. It's mostly about making rational calculations of interests and seeing where the balance of power lies and seeing what's possible, and. Um, Although my background is in, in China expertise, I'm increasingly occupied with looking at how Europe, European member states and the European Union formulate foreign policies. And there I see um, the great strides we've made in particularly defensive measures uh, when it comes to, for instance, Chinese uh, economic bullying, um, but still real constraints when it comes to helping democracy movements. Um, um, uh, and even responding to what happened in Hong Kong in a meaningful manner. Um, so I guess I'm, I'm, if you're asking me how I've, how I've listened, extremely interested and, and still uh, worried to some extent about the, uh, about the, on the one hand, the hope and on the other hand, the, the constraints that I see. Yeah, um, are you more pessimistic on that side? Um, I guess for Hong Kong, I'm very pessimistic. Um, in a way, I don't feel like of the, I the, of the place here to, to to judge on Hong Kong's fate because Nathan obviously is the uh, expert on that. But I see that the Chinese state has been making great strides in turning that more authoritarian way, and 
as of now, I see that even keeping that democracy movement uh, alive to some extent, also beyond the borders of, of Hong Kong and China, has been a, an, an enormous achievement of Nathan and his colleagues. Um, but I see very little meaningful international action to support that, okay. to real change. Yeah. Um, Thijs Reuten, uh, welcome. You are in the European Parliament. We just talked a little bit about the national security law um, that became uh, uh, in work in Hong Kong. Uh, how did the European Parliament respond to that? Well, uh, quite strongly, I would say. Um, that is uh, well, just also about uh, the best thing we can do. Uh, we have to convey that message of support, first of all, to the people in Hong Kong, and, and secondly, also to our member states. I think the European Parliament um, historically is uh, also a little bit the guardian of the fundamental rights, not only in the European Union, but we really want to uh, also contribute to, to spreading uh, democracy and fundamental rights in the rest of the world. So this law clearly violating previous agreements, um, but also um, signaling, I think, and and a signal also for the European Union to lose every remaining naivety about the real meaning, uh, the, the real strategy of China, because um, make no mistake, uh, autocrats, whether they are in China or totalitarian regimes, do have plans. They have strategies, they have long-term strategies, and uh, we should lose every inch of naivety that still uh, is in us. Yeah, um, and you said the European Union uh, reacted strongly. Um, what do you mean by that? Sanctions? Well, the European Parliament. Eh? Yeah, oh, sorry. Yeah. <laughs> My responsibility is in the European Parliament also to give a voice uh, yeah. to people uh, like the people in Hong Kong. I see that as my, my, my duty. Uh, but uh, to, to, to picture a little bit of the other side of the European Union, uh, we also have the 27 member states. We have the European Commission. Um, and, um, well, it was, it was thanks to the uh, resistance in the European Parliament, for instance, that this trade deal that was... Uh, um, uh, done by uh, um, Chancellor Merkel before she left uh, with China, the, the trade and investment deal. Um, uh, I think that partly due to the pressure of the uh, European Parliament, uh, it was, um, uh, um, it's now in the, in the, in the uh, it's frozen, huh? yeah. <laughs> as, we, as we say. But um, uh, of course, there were also other uh, things. Uh, there was the uh, sanctions by the European Union met with counter sanctions from uh, China, also on members of the European Parliament. So the European Parliament is directly involved as yeah. an actor. Um, but uh, yes, the message sent from some member states is not always good. And I think also, for example, the whole situation with Lithuania, for example, could have been dealt with in a much more um, assertive and decisive way, because we basically let down one of our member states there, eh? favoring trade interests that we have with China. Yeah, and um, that's not possible because not all member states are uh, seeing eye to eye on that. Well, there is certainly uh, a room for improvement. <laughs> uh, I'm, I'm, I, I, I would not be able to do my job if I would not be an optimist, but there's certainly room for improvement on the uh, unit. And we are learning. We are learning now in response to, to Russia and into to the, the war in Ukraine. Uh, but, but definitely, I think geopolitically, we also have to understand that there is... Well, of course, a difference between China and Russia, but there is no difference in the way that you have to deal in a different way with autocrats and totalitarian regimes, whereas with countries that more or less still accept some kind of rules-based yeah. international order. Yeah. Nathan, um, you are also, of course, now advocating for the Hong Kong uh, people around the world. Um, what do you expect from the international community? I guess we all understand that um, having a statement of support is definitely not enough for us to overturn the situation. And um, the origin of Hong Kong's deterioration of freedom is also because China's growing confidence over its totalitarianism. <coughs> if you look at um, the time when the like human rights situation in Hong Kong, in China, um, declined so, um, 
so also um, rapidly it was um, after uh, Xi Jinping um, resumed office, and for now they even wrote um, the confidence towards their culture, towards their politics, the confidence towards their whole totalitarian system into their constitution, which marks that um, they no longer have to rely on Hong Kong as an example of showing that China is moving towards liberalism, yeah. and they have um, since after uh, have no restraints on imposing the worldview and their politics to Hong Kong. So I think at the end of the day, uh, the questions we have to ask is, of course, we wanted to help Hong Kong. There are certain policies that can um, try to alleviate the tension, alleviate the situation, like sanctioning Hong Kong officials, um, making sure that um, um, human rights uh, perpetrators um, or organizations that assist that have difficulties going into the international uh, spectrum. But uh, most importantly is how we can, um, with collective efforts, and with um, growing solidarity in between democratic countries, create an environment to let these dictators know or force them to know that that totalitarianism is not going to work and we need democracy and freedom. Yeah, and is that done enough at this moment? Of course, uh, we've been campaigning for more measures um, like how we can have a much uh, a, a larger platform for democratic leaders to sit together and to counter the rise of authoritarianism and, and to ha uh, and to have um, global strategy and global agenda like the way that they did with climate change. Mm -hmm. um, and also we, we've been encouraging countries to re decrease their reliance as we understand that from the Ukraine war, how reliance on um, a dictator could turn to leverage for them to invade into another country and to diminish the response um, the democratic countries could collectively deliver. I think these are on process and have not done enough, but of course we understand that um, it, it just takes time to, to balance and, and, and to find a yeah. way that we can satisfy um, the, the, the crowd in the country, but also the need to tackle the rise of authoritarianism. Can I ask you a question? I'm, I was struck by your uh, trinity of of, t of C's, uh, um, commitment, caution, and, and calm, I think, uh, or, or maybe there were several others, but at least the commitment and, and, and caution and calm stuck with me. Um, I think European audiences, in general electorates, and therefore also their governments, are struggling to find, let's say, a wise and meaningful attitude towards this new role of China in world politics. So I think for a long time, Generally, and this research showed this, China wasn't really that much of a topic in, in European political debate. That has changed rapidly. So now it is very much a topic. And um, even though with the U Ukraine war um, on the agenda now, the role of China is, is being called out and, and, and looked. So it, that's not going away. Um, and I think from the naivety that you touched upon, I think that was very real and alive um, a couple of years ago, 2018, I guess, was the count, the, the, the tilting point. Um, when you look, for instance, at public opinion surveys and so forth, we see, or I see, um, that you know, paranoia uh, and 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 animosity basically is is very much on the rise as a general attitude towards how to look at China's new role in the world. And I was struck by that commitment, caution, and calm, and also in your book, the number of times that you quote Liu Xiaobo and his famous dictum of no enemies, no hatred. Um, whereas I think in Europe, increasingly, we see China as, as an animus um, uh, actor in this struggle between authoritarian regimes and democratic regimes. So what would, from your perspective, be a wise general attitude? What is or what should China be to us, uh, if not that enemy, and if not that hatred? I think we, we must um, not conflate the concept of a country, um, a regime, and its people. Mm. Um, I do think that Chinese Communist Party is the enemy of democracy, is the enemy of liberalism, but not China as a concept of a country, and not the Chinese people as a group of people who most of them are victims of this totalitarian governance. So for me, um, uh, w what we have tackled is, as I said, the growing confidence of the Chinese Communist Party. And we also have to um, translate that kind of like animosity or like 
really negative attitude of, of people towards China, which in effect towards the leadership of the Chinese government um, into yeah. concrete policy change. Um, that, that could be manifest in many different ways. For example, when I was just in the United Kingdom, the government, uh, it was like 2020 June, the government was still discussing whether to incorporate Huawei into the 5G infra infrastructure, which Huawei was, of course, um, a major competitor and Chinese company that um, is allegedly sending information of users back to China for multiple purposes. Um, by then, it, the, 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 the government was still trying to push that but with that kind of campaign and raising awareness and a lot of opposition from the backbenchers, um, it was successfully overturned. Mm. Um, a lot of these policies can can be overturned if the people and the political scene had, have enough support. And I do think that there is a process of accumulation of how we can work more on decreasing reliance or at least stop adding reliance on them and then translate it into a change of um, um, China policy and, and change of, of um, the way that we see it and then to consolidate better collective efforts and to have agenda and actions together. Because I, I do believe that if, if European countries and, and the US and many other major democratic countries is getting together, it is much more than half of the world's economy. Yeah. And with that kind of mass, uh, we can definitely change something. So is it possible to go together with the USA on this topic? Well, that's that's a very good question, of course. I mean, um, I, I fully agree with, with, with the necessity of, and I think the three... Uh, the caution uh, the, and, 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 and the calm is, 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 is important. But when we realize that the strategy that we adapted so far is not working, it's clear that we need another strategy. And yes, I think that there is room for different accents and also different approaches between uh, the United States and, and Europe. But that uh, requires one thing a united uh, voice in Europe, a united foreign policy, uh, because we are a very strong uh, actor uh, economically. We are now growing as a geopolitical hard power. Uh, we have to learn our lessons very fast. Uh, and I think that um, we need to uh, carefully position ourselves, but as a block, not let, letting uh, uh, other people try to play us apart. Uh, uh, that goes for China, that goes uh, uh, for Russia. So it needs to be clear what message is coming from, from Europe. And of course, that means that also all kind of actions in terms of supporting people with scholarships, with, with supporting directly uh, uh, free media uh, uh, outside uh, Hong Kong, uh, combining the economic power with clear demands on human rights. That is possible. I am not, uh, I do not belong to the school of skepticism uh, uh, when it comes to sanctions, targeted sanctions, not the same kind of sanctions we're seeing now with Russia because it's a different situation. But I think, I do believe that we have more, uh, um, thing, uh, more um, tools in our toolbox uh, to work uh, on this. But it must be clear that the old strategy uh, of appeasement, of dialogue, is not working uh, with, with autocrats and totalitarian regimes. You have to be very clear and you have to be also um, uh, responding in a way that is understood. Uh, and, and I think one of the important things is to, to continue to show the support uh, also to the people there. But are we, uh, how economically dependent are we from yes. China? Well, that is a good point also made by, uh, by Nathan Law. Uh, I think that uh, the lesson that we are learning now also from our dependence on energy uh, from Russia is that it is never, never, never a good idea to be dependent on one country, be it for energy, be it for cr uh, critical um, uh, resources that you will need uh, as we are I have a list of 147 uh, things that we uh, can only uh, get uh, from China. But I, and that is, I think, also important to note, I think we need to be prepared also to, at some, some point, pay a price. Democracy and human rights are not free. And, I'm, and, and I mean with that, that uh, at some point, uh, it could be that some change of supplies will be disrupted maybe for a shorter time, maybe for a longer time. You have to be prepared to do that because that is also something we should have learned from how we dealt before with autocrats. If you threaten them with sanctions but do not uh, effectuate them, do not uh, implement them, then of course you are losing not once 
but also the next time and the time after that. So we need to be prepared at some point to also uh, take part of the burden, part of the cost uh, ourselves. But it's not, we're not there yet. Yeah. But we need to uh, diversify our uh, uh, supply of, of resources by not coming dependent on one country, especially not a totalitarian regime. Thies, is the European Union strong enough to, to do all this? Yeah, um, it, 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 it's interesting. I'm, I'm thinking about this hypothesis that, and I think I disagree with it, <laughs> respectfully. Um, That's always important. Yeah. Um, this hypothesis that we uh, need unity to, and, and specifically unity on values to meaningfully act in our relationship with China. And um, why I tend to doubt it is because it is, it offers a, an, an, a relatively easy opportunity for leaders like Viktor Orban to exploit that very important position that you know the weakest chain has. It gives them lots of space to to to, to game that position, right? Um, and that we see happening, for instance, when it comes to and you you call that out, I think, very well in your book. When it comes to declarations on human rights violations in China in general and in, in, in Hong Kong specifically, then um, Mr. Orban is very eager to take the stage and block that kind of declaration. And um, then you can say, well, we can't meaningfully act in relation to China if we cannot reach unity. And before we can do that, we have to reach that kind of unity. But when you look at, for instance, some of the defensive measures against Chinese economic coercion, but also the Magnitsky Act, you see that, for instance, Hungary is willing to join in line if enough pressure is applied from the right places, Berlin, for instance, and Washington, if it helps. And there you see that it's not just unity based on values and idealism. It's the political will to take initiative and to force everyone to step in line. And actually, I think, for instance, the when you ask me, is the EU strong enough? I think, no, in and of itself, it certainly isn't. But the EU, driven by agendas, uh, specifically of countries that have a concrete capacity and an interest in a specific domain that is relevant to China relations, um, can, if not with unanimous support in the first instance, make great strides in making Europe as a whole stronger. And I think, for instance, um, you know, what's been done with the European CHIPS Act doesn't literally tackle or target China, but it makes Europe vastly more yeah, yeah. strong. Can you and that is this act? Yeah, so maybe you can explain it better, but it's, it's, it's a major breakthrough in, in, in funding basically a, a geopolitically strong semiconductor industry in Europe. Yeah. And it's been driven by a couple of member states together with the EU institutions to, that have a specific capacity and interest in this. So no, we don't always have to wait for Viktor Orban to to block everything. To, to stop his no, but, little theater. But, but I, I, I don't think that we disagree that much. Yeah. I was also talking about, and, and we need reforms internally in the European mm -hmm. Union. Yeah, I am a strong proponent of more uh, uh, majority decision making, also in foreign policy. If we do not uh, make that reform or explore the possibilities that are already in the treaty, eh, because that is something we, we forget sometimes. Uh, it is also sometimes self uh, self-imposed uh, uh, unanimity thinking huh, that, that the European Council is doing because we do not want to stir the boat uh, too much. Huh? So we are now also talking already, uh, it's, he's mentioned three times, Mr. Orban. Huh? That's way too much honor, uh, but we need to become more assertive also internally and solve our problems with the rule of law internally first because they hamper our credibility. And a, a, a last point that I uh, would want to not forget to make that also the way we speak about our own values, about democracy, but also about what's happening in other countries. Eh? For instance, the way that was spoken here about the election of Mr. Lee. No, he was not elected, he was appointed. Uh, and, uh, and his mere appointment should be reason for the European Union and other democracies to at least uh, 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 go, to, go to China and say, look, uh, we, we need uh, clarification on this. But that is, that is, that is only one. But also uh, the way we speak about China, the growing assertiveness of China. 
No, that is not what it is. It is a deliberate and structural systemic violation and breakdown of international rules-based order. Yeah, um, they are simply saying uh, human rights, human rights, th these are your human rights. No, they are not your human rights. They are universal human rights also uh, under uh, uh, signed by uh, by China, for that matter. Uh, so we let them get away too much, not only the Chinese themselves, but also our public opinion, with this kind of language that sort of, well, kind of... It's uh, a little bit fake. Yeah, we need to be a little bit more assertive ourselves, not talking about assertive China, no. We need to be assertive ourselves when it comes to defending the things that we too long took for granted this international order, multilateralism, which is clearly being violated and also undermined by China. The, the example of, of, of Interpol, uh, China has a growing influence in all these international organizations. So they abuse Interpol with sending, sending out, out red notices, yeah. which a member state of Interpol can do, but no one checks whether this red notice is actually uh, valid. Or not. valid. Yeah. Uh, which leads to people also from Xinjiang being imprisoned in countries uh, based on, and these red notices get withdrawn two weeks after the arrest. But well, that sort of thing, we need to be much more vigilant about that. The influence in the WHO, we saw it at the COVID pandemic. That is not just something that's happening. That is a sign of a clear strategy and a clear path uh, which wants to undermine, uh, maybe <laughs> you can, can say something about it as well, but uh, that's the feeling I have. Yeah, well, um, I don't want to make this more pessimistic, but when I was reading your book, <laughs> I was a little bit disappointed in how European countries react to the assertiveness of China. So, for instance, you talk about uh, the Nobel Prize uh, of Peace being given. Uh, can you tell a little bit about that? Yeah, that was a really um, strong example of how China coerced um, the other countries using their economic might. Um, in 2010, when uh, No Xiaobo was awarded um, the Nobel Peace Prize, Beijing had sanctions over uh, Norway's exports. Um, what's worth notice is um, the, the, the action of awarding that um, uh, uh, Nobel Peace Prize was not made by the government, it was made by the Nobel Peace, Nobel Price Prize Institute, yeah. and it was independent from it. But China ab abused that and, and kind of like imposed a strong sanction so that Norway had years of retreat, not only criticizing China's uh, human rights, but also human rights in general. So it, it really shows um, how a big economic country like China um, can use their economic might to attack a, a, a relatively small economic sized country um, when that country has not received support from uh, yeah. larger allies yeah. that they will end up in a strong isolation and, and they will suffer more. So um, I think in that sense, um, there's no way to blame like Norwegian government to make that decision but we should definitely reflect that whether we've got our mechanism right in place. Um, when a certain country in our allies being attacked economically, whether the other countries could react, it was like the concept of like economic um, 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 version of the Article 5 of NATO alliance, which one country being attacked economically, that the other countries should respond as well, because that is also a weapon um, for the Chinese government to undermine our democracy yeah. and human rights. So a lot of this discussion, discussion, I think, we should definitely look into. And um, the thing about international organizations, we, we've been always saying that it's, it's, it's quite disappointing to see how China could clearly manipulate these organizations. Um, there are already a lot of human rights organizations like Human Rights Watch. They are proposing many like um, suggestions to how we can consolidate these organizations in order to really make sure it is performing its original purpose, um, the mission of the organization instead of being manipulated by Manai forces. Um, I think this is, this is also a, a, a area of concern that are being addressed by the human rights sector. Yeah, and of course we, we already know for years about the Uyghurs uh, and what's happening to them. Um, and there's also, it's really hard to put sanctions or to put anything in place that will relieve it in any way. 
I think that there are definitely examples of how、um, the red notice in the in- international in-、uh, in the, in the Interpol that are being abused.、Um, um, but I also feel like that there, there is still a lack of、um, understanding and and lack of awareness, not only in these international organizations, but also.、Um, In 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 many countries,、um, the broader public. Yeah, yeah. yeah.、Uh, we we needed to understand how China like abused the system, and、um, at least when, for example, there are still European countries that are having extradition treaty with China. Of course, we want them to uplift them. We want to shelve them. But if they're not going to do so, then at least they have to understand that, like, whenever they get the red notices, they have to double check, double check whether it is out of political motive. Things, things like this. China always use non-political crimes, like saying that they're evading taxes,、um, that they have hit someone and then ex- and then and then ran away. Things like this to to put them on these red notices.、Um, at least we we need that kind of awareness and and reminding each and every countries, and and maybe sometimes forcefully forcefully for them to not to carry out these politically motivated um um charges brought by Beijing. Yeah. Um, I want to go to the room to see if there are any questions. But before that, I have one last question.、Um, we are talking about. Um, Uh, uh, how to repress、uh, the influence of China and how to do sanctions and to punish them? But is there tis, any chance that there will come some revolt from within China against、uh, the dictatorship? Yeah. Th- so I, gu- I guess there's a very ambiguous answer, and that's yes and no. Yes, <laughs>、uh, yes, and the one ev- piece of evidence for that, because there's no concrete evidence for really any meaningful political movement. It- Being able to exist in China with that kind of potential effect, but the one point of evidence I would, if I were to argue that that side of the of the case, is the paranoia of the Chinese state. They wouldn't be so afraid of student protesters in Hong Kong or wherever,、um, if you know, the Chinese state hasn't been. And this is not just the Communist Party, but this is this is a fear for centuries that if one has to govern a country of this size. A popular uprising is always lurking behind the corner, and you know、uh, this,、um, uh, you know this this mighty temple of power may just fall. So I think yes, no. There's 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 no meaningful no meaningful concrete evidence of a, of that that at least I know of um, um, of of social movements playing a. Meaningful role because, whereas in in Hong Kong, in a few years, civic society, civil society, sorry,、um, you describe very strongly, I think, in your book, was quashed in Hong Kong. In mainland China, it has virtually never been allowed to exist. To exist.、Uh, um, in in the eighties, there was some relative freedom, and、um, the end of that was why Liu Xiaobo was in prison. So I I I would. Strongly veer towards the no, but then I see the the strength with which Xi Jinping tries to hide his paranoia, and I think maybe yes. <laughs> but, but oh, sorry. No, but I also noticed your desire to have some optimism also <laughs> in the in the debate, and and and, and yes, I I, I understand、eh, the ambiguity of the of the answer, but. Uh, the parallel with with Russia, for example, is also that the the the, the defining element is the the fear for democracy, the fear for freedom.、Uh, that is what uh, uh, what 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 makes them most uh, uh, what makes them shake most. And and I think that it's also important. And 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 Nathan highlighted that we, with our fight, with our call for attention, call for for action, are never ever the enemy. Of the Chinese people, as we are never the enemy of the Polish people when we talk about the independent judiciary. There, we are the partners, and we have to remain the partners of the people who 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 aspire to some form of democracy, who aspire to some freedom. Maybe, hopefully, also、uh, in 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 China. Yeah, so, so yes, I want to remain optimistic, but at the same time,、uh, that 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 we have to combine that. With、uh, absolutely not being、uh, naive、uh, any any more, and concrete actions, propose an alternative towards the Belt Road Initiative, the Global Gateway, but not as we did it now, because that is peanuts. 
eh, compared to what China is uh, bringing, but proposing real alternatives to the strangle loans that China gives to Montenegro and to, and to uh, other countries in the Western Balkans. Re show, show how we do business. Eh, so there is a lot to work on, eh, uh, uh, and we, we should do that. Well, under, that, under this circumstance, I think it's foolish to be an optimist, but it is even worse to be a pessimist. <laughs> um, I do feel like as part of um, the, the complex, as a part of the puzzle, um, we've also got our agency to, to try to make things better. And um, from a perspective of looking in what China are facing, they're facing a weakened ally, which is Russia. Yeah. Um, they are facing difficulties in industrial transformation because a lot of, um, I, I think the academia has certain degree agree that they are in certain middle income trap that they are unable to um, upstream the, 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 the industrial um, industry and a lot of their competitive um, edge were being compromised. They're in an aging society that they, if, if they're, they're losing that advantage of like a wool factory, there will be billion, not billion, hundreds of millions of workers out of work. And also with the COVID pandemic, I think it's fair to say that it is not um, surprising if there will be a huge legitimacy crisis for Beijing, whether it will lead us to democracy, to a very fragmented communist party, or even with a much more draconian dictator. I don't think we have the answer, but we, what we can see is there could be change. And with change, there could be possibility. And with possibility, there could be hope. <laughs> that's, a, that's a very good ending. Thank you. <laughs>Yeah, thank you for the question. If I get it um, uh, all right, uh, we're, we're saying that in, in what circumstance that, that could be that could be a solution achieved in between these places, right? Um, I think um, Taiwan has expressed their stance very clearly that they do not accept they are being annexed by China. Um, and Xi Jinping also said that um, if it's necessary, they will use they they will so called take over Taiwan by force. And um, I think it, it, this is um, something that also plays into um, the, the circumstance of the Ukraine war, which I, I found it um, less uh, for, for China. They will feel more pressure if they're going to go into war in Taiwan. Um, and, and, and therefore, I think that there's always possibility um, that for now, at least um, a status quo and, and, and increasing um, network of support for Taiwan, um, including strengthening the support from, not, uh, from, from South Korea and Japan, which they are the two of the most important allies um, in the region, and to make sure that um, the support um, is getting stronger. I, I do think that um, there's a possibility that um, that status quo um, could remain for a while uh, without anything big to, to break um, the, certain, the, the, the current situation. It's very silent. Oh, yeah, here. Hi, uh, thank you for your talk. So I do have actually several questions, but I'll start with one. Uh, <laughs> so, I mean, actually, yeah, really nicely coming from the quote that two uh, times quoted from the book, which is about, uh, you discussed a little bit about no enemy, no, no hatred. And, and I don't know, if, so if 
probably you have been aware now that the, there are like 20,000 Hong Kong immigrants, first and second generation in, in the Netherlands, for example. And, and there are uh, surprisingly a lot of the older generation immigrants are very pro-China in some way. And um, so how do you think we should treat um, people that are very politically different, but in a way did you also think that they are a part of the community? How, how, do, how do you think we should approach this? Um, and I, I do think it is important to have some sort of unity, but I, I would really like to know how, how you think about it. Well, um, thanks so much. Um, I think in the context of Liu Xiaobo saying that way, um, he said that he doesn't hate the God, he doesn't hate the judge, he doesn't hate the policeman who arrested him. He was saying that the, the hate is not about personal, the, the, it's about the system, it's about the whole system that persecute him. So I think that is also the case. Um, we can see Chinese Communist Party and its suppressive system as the enemy of our values and our state to a certain extent. Um, but to individuals, we, we always have to be reminded that um, being carried away by hatred or anger is not, is not always the best way to, to, to tackle it and, and, or to make sure that they um, would suffer some, from certain consequence. And um, for me, I think uh, the best way to do it is to continue to spread our message in the community, uh, make, make the whole community, for example, the, the Dutch community, to understand that these people who are pro Beijing's approach, um, their, their opinion is will not welcome here. Um, and this kind of like anti-democratic setting, it, it, it is not welcome here. And then to, um, to, to make um, the environments that um, they would in certain degree forced to reflect or suffer from reputation loss or things like this. Um, I, I, I genuinely do not think that any like kind of like direct conflict or or suggestions that would directly harm them would be good. I, I think we, we should, on the other hand, to try to educate more people in, in, in the area about what we are pursuing, why they are not our allies, and, and, and let the public to make the decision. Well, um, thank you so much. Oh, yeah, one last question. No, don't worry. <laughs> um, this may be a little bit off the strongly political um, subject. Um, and if it's too personal, please feel free to say, I, I don't want to share it. But I was very interested if you had um, some sort of last conversation with your parents, uh, whether they uh, left you with support or, uh, and, and how, that, how, that, how that was for you. Um, well, thank you so much. Um, as I said in the book, I was unable to like say a proper goodbye because when if they knew that I was leaving and the government feels like they knew that they could be submitted for persecution because they assisted me uh, want a vegetative to leave so that could probably um, not the best way to protect them um, so I didn't particularly um, engaged in a like proper goodbye um, but I, I do think that, that there's a matter of choice um, in the in the book I also lay out uh, difficulties that we, we always have to make choices. Um, uh, uh, well, you always encounter a situation that you have to choose between being a son or being an activist. Sometimes these two things conflict. Um, sometimes if you are an activist, you will do something that worry your mother. <laughs> and it comes so often into the formula. And most of the time, um, I chose the side of an activist um, that was kind of like... Um, um, the, the certain guilt and, and, and sorrowness I have to, um, to, to my family, to my mother. Um, but I also do feel like everyone has to make choices. Um, I'm not the only one to make choices. Many more people make much tougher choices than I. So um, in, in the setting of living in this totalitarian or authoritarian city, that sometimes we don't have much choices. Well, thank you so much. Uh, I think we can uh, engage in conversation uh, at the bar uh, still and also uh, have time to read your beautiful book. Thank you so much for being here, Nathan Law, and also thanks to Thies Dams and Thijs Reuter. Thank you very much. Thank you.